Today on the Mr. Maple Show podcast, Matt and Tim count down the top 25 conifers of 2023. Customer's Choice. you all y'all and welcome to the mr maple show i'm matt and i'm tim guys today we've got a conifer podcast so get excited yeah we're gonna be talking about our top 25 conifers that sold in 2023 uh you guys really enjoyed our list we did on maples and on ginkgos so go check those out on all major podcast platforms or on YouTube. Now, we air these every Saturday on any major podcast platform. You can give us five stars on there. We also air these on Sunday evenings with a live chat on the YouTube channel, The Mr. Maple Show. So feel free to join that community. Hop in that chat. We've got a great list here for you, though. We're going to talk about some conifers that get us fired up, some conifers that really this is you guys' pick. So these are the these are the Consumer Choice Awards, really. These are the ones that you guys said were your favorite conifers on Mr. Maple in 2023 these are the ones that put up the best numbers and so these are numbers that we had in high quantity and you purchased so this is our top sales of 2023 for our conifers let's jump right into it guys we've got at number 25 pinus mugo karsten's winter gold dwarf mountain pine ah this is a great plant now this is one uh, that's always popular, Mr. Maple. I think if you check any year, this one's probably, you know, on on our top sales list. It's got high drama. I mean, it brings the golden color, especially in the winter, as the name implies. It actually gets more yellow in the winter months. This one's going to be more of a green during the summer, a little bit. Then those needles, as it cools off, get more and more intense to almost an electric yellow late. Love exactly what this one does. It gives you a real spark of color, especially for an evergreen in that winter garden. I love evergreens that kind of go through some changes. So you kind of get a little bit of change in beauty there with evergreens, which is exceptional. And this one's durable. I mean, being a being a Mugo, this one's going to work zones five through eight. So it's got a lot. It's going to be pretty small, basically like a three by three kind of bun shape. I love what the Mugo pines do, but Carson's does it in that extra dramatic fashion. In the springtime, it's got some yellow color. In the summer, it's got some yellow color. But that winter, it really lights up. And it is one of the most intense pines during those winter months. It brings that yellow almost like unlike any other conifer. I think we could have sold possibly even more of these if we would have had more in stock because this one did sell out. Um, but Karsten's, or sometimes people call it Karsten's Winter Gold, it is an exceptional dwarf mugo pine that I think more people need to use. One, because it's easy to use. All these conifers, make sure you give them good drainage. But Karsten's get lights up the landscape with that yellow color. Yeah, so it is a great disclaimer that some things do sell out. <laughs> so they might be in, they might have done better had they not sold out. So going from uh, one of the most popular golds to one of the most popular blues, here at number 24, we got Pinostrobus Blue Shag. Now, now Grandma had some uh, like green shag carpet back in the 70s. When I was a kid, it was still around the 80s, so I remember the, the green shag carpet. I don't think I've seen too much blue shag. But it does have that sort of shaggy-like appearance. It gives you that blue color. It's got the longer needles. It's the reason I love this white pine witch's broom. I mean, it's going to be three foot by four foot in 10 years, fitting in a lot of people's small spaces in the landscape, so it gives you that extra blue color in a smaller space. Now, Dr. Sid Waxman did name this one uh, as a mutation in the late 70s. So, of course, he was channeling all that uh, disco blue shag carpet. (laughs) Nonetheless, had to to have some blue shag carpet connotations to that one. This one's a nice compact tree, though. It's nice and dense. I see a lot of people, even our picture I think we use a lot, is people using this one in container because it looks really nice. It kind of makes a nice topper to a container sometimes. Just has that real, you know, nice, dense quality to it. I mean, it, it fits in texturally very well. Sid Waxman is famous for so many witches' brooms, so many looking through the genetics of seedlings from witches' brooms and all these cool plants, and he thought Blue Shag was cool enough to name. It's definitely cool enough for your garden. All right, hopping in here at the Michael Jordan spot, number 23. we got a popular tree that would probably be even more popular had it not sold out quickly. We've got uh, Pinus Sylvestris, green penguin. Now, this is one I would say in a normal season may even be a lot higher up on the list for us, even that top three spot. We did sell out of it, didn't get back on the website till kind of late in the year, 
But uh, normally, uh, this isn't our top three. It really is. And everything's in a great name for a plant. And this has a phenomenal name because the shape of this conifer is like a little penguin. It gets four foot by two foot in 10 years. Being a Pinus silvestris, it is very hardy for many people all across the country. It's easy to grow. It fits in those dwarf conifer beds, but doesn't take up a lot of space, being that it's, you know, it's got a, a height to it, but not a lot of width. And, you know, it even isn't that tall of a conifer out there. So it fits in fairy gardens, railroad gardens. It's a fun tree to use out in the landscape for sure. This one was found by Jim Lewis of J Farms, and it is a nice tree. I mean, this one's going to work zones four through eight. Uh, fits a lot of places. Obviously looks great in a container for that small penguin shape. Again, anytime you can name a tree after a critter, you're going to get kids involved, right? Anytime kids see a penguin, they're going to come back and check on a penguin. Uh, absolutely adore this one in the garden. Perfect shape, perfect color. Uh, you know, it actually makes a perfect little Christmas tree, too. So if you put it up next to the house, you can decorate this one in that miniature garden. Uh, but a lot of people use this one even for the railroad gardens because it's, it's going to give you the connotations of a big tree, even in a small, compact habit. Now, J Farms, that's the American branch of Yellow Nursery or uh, Jetalo Nursery. Many of y'all know that may know that name from Jetalo Orange that we have in the Maples. It's often pronounced Yetalo. I understand why they took the name J and just said, let's just call it J Farms. Because then, you know, people weren't trying to say it with a Y sound or a J sound. It's just simple and easy for people to say. But Green Penguin is one of their best introductions to date. And it is an exceptional tree. Going in zones three through eight, I mean, there's so many people who can grow this tree. And it is an exceptional green color year round out there in the landscape. Awesome tree. And again, that compact dense habit to it really brings it. Uh, we, we listed as four foot by two foot in 10 years. It, it's just dwarf and compact. It's, it's really nice. And it fits so many landscapes because of that compact shape and habit. Coming in at number 22, we've got Thuya Occidentalis de Groot Spire. I am Groot. I am Degroot. I am Degroot. All right. <laughs> Great plant, y'all. This one's going to work zones four through eight. Um, this one is one of the quintessential columnar uh, conifers you can be growing. It's easy to grow. It's durable. It's kind of fast growing for a, a columnar conifer as well. So, you know, a lot of people will use this one as uh, columns going into a garden. It's a great use for kind of having that formal garden format where you can kind of create some some columns. Uh, you know, one of our favorite customers has them in front of his house beside the columns out on his porch, and it just makes a great accompaniment to that, that architecture that's already in place there. It kind of gives some bones to the garden as well. I like it because it's both fast growing compared to mini maples. I mean, six to eight inches of growth in a year, but it's slow growing in comparison to something like an emerald green. And so it fits in a lot of people's landscape. It's manageable and doesn't take up a lot of width. And that's one of the best things about DeGroote Spires. It can give you that screen effect. It can give you this tall vertical interest, but it's not taking up a lot of space while it's doing it. And for me, it's one of the most outstanding, most outstanding conifers for that narrow shape gives you a nice crisp clean fill out there in the landscape and it's one that as soon as we started offering it here at mr maple people were going crazy we had a large one that we were growing on our bank here at mr maple and i was like you know we're offering that soon and we started doing rooted cuttings of it and i mean we can't do enough of degroot spire great plant gonna work zones four through eight very durable uh, as an arborvitae and just easy to grow it's one that grows from cuttings and uh, i absolutely love the plant go check out our video on how to propagate it from cuttings. There is a good video on that on YouTube. Guys, coming up at number 21, we've got Camacypris nucatensis glaucopendula, the weeping Alaskan cedar. Oh, great specimen. I mean, this one really architecturally is one of those monuments in the garden. It's a big tree, gorgeous. It's going to work zones four through eight, and it's going to give you, you know, just that, that otherworldly feel. I mean, it definitely has that feel of being almost somewhere you know, in a, in a lodge kind of deal too. It's like, it's got that, that otherworldly kind of relaxing quality to it. It'll end up getting 16 feet in height by about eight foot in width in 10 years with an upright habit that's still pendulous. So it, the, the vertical interest comes directly from the terminal. So it keeps going upwards, but the side branches have this wonderful, graceful weeping habit that just gives this overall plant a thing of beauty out there in the landscape. You know, people argue all the time if this is Camacyparis nucatensis or if it is Capressus nucatensis. 
taxonomists change the names all the time. <laughs> right. But Dr. Creature always says taxonomists got to eat too. I'm like, well, they need to quit eating so much. You guys got to quit changing on us. We're tired of printing the labels. Yeah, I'm tired of printing labels and I'm tired of changing uh, things. People look for it for camis- as Camisipris nucatensis. So that's what we're sticking with for now. We're doing that here and we're doing it at the Buckholtz farm. So this one does make a nice size tree. Uh, 16 by 8 is what we typically list this one at in 10 years. So it does fill out quite nicely. Uh, so it's fairly fast growing for an Alaskan cedar as well. Coming at number 20, we've got Camisipris obtusa, Camina heba. This is a nice dwarf. Uh, you know, only at about three feet tall, by about two feet wide, even in 10 years. We always give a 10 year example. A lot of people ask why we do that. You know, a lot of these conifers are going to outlive us all. So some of these could live well over 100 years. So always try to give a 10 year garden expectancy. And we think that's the most honest way to give gardeners realistic sizes. A lot of people say at maturity can be a little disingenuous when they say at maturity, this is 40 by 40 for everything or at maturity, this is five by five for everything. So that's what, that's what ends up happening with that maturity. So you're just saying a 10 year expectancy a lot. Now this is a good zones four through eight, but Kamina Heba gives you some really good bright yellow color as a dwarf Anoki cypress out there in the landscape. And the way this thing has mutated into its dense compact habit it really has a unique texture out there in the landscape that is different than many of your other Hinoki cypresses. Uh, there's a gorgeous one of these at the Dawes Arboretum. It is much older than 10 years old, and I fell in love with it whenever I was seeing that in Newark, Ohio at the Dawes, and I said, man, that's a tree that we've got to get in production at Mr. Maple. It just has this tough appearance out there in the landscape and fits in so many small spaces because it is, it is slow growing and dense and compact. Yeah, it kind of mounds up, so it has this kind of soft, fluffy texture to it. Um, you want to give it a little bit of sun for its best color. If you got this one too much shade, it won't have as much of that like soft yellow going on. Excellent overall plant to be growing. Uh, we've really been impressed with it. Now, this one's going to work uh, also in that zones four through eight kind of range. Coming in at 19, we've got Pinus nigra, green tower. And this is a commoner Austrian black pine. It gives you that vertical interest out there in the landscape, gives you this sort of stoic presence, and it just fits in so many people's gardens because it's tall and narrow. Uh, Black pines are awesome plants, whether Japanese black pines, Austrian black pines, or Australian black pines, whatever you call it. This one's awesome. It's going to work in that zones four through eight as well. At around eight feet tall by about two feet wide, it's a nice columnar shape in 10 years. And it kind of just gives you a real tough look. I like how this one, you know, with black pines, you kind of get that that real rigid look to them. And this one has an awesome look to it. I like how it, the texture and everything it adds in the garden, but that columnar habit, especially when it's kindling, it just looks, it looks like it's got a lot going on just within this one plant. I like the rich green color of the needles, the brown kind of color of the stemming. Uh, It gives something rich out there in the landscape. And the fact that it's so narrow, I mean, it's one of the most narrow selections of the pine trees. It, it's so fun to use out there in the landscape because it gives you some nice vertical, out there with an evergreen interest. All right, coming in here at number 18, we've got Cedrus Atlantica Galauca, a blue atlas cedar. Now, the Cedrus Atlanticas are some of my favorite conifers. They can give you some outstanding blues out there. And with a term like Glauca, which you often see in conifers so frequently, this one definitely gives you some blue color on a blue atlas cedar. It gives you this really nice upright presence, And this is a a conifer that can end up getting 12 feet by 4 foot in 10 years. So it's not something that grits out there really quickly, but it still makes a large specimen over time. And this is one of those plants that is just gives you that good blue color you can't get out of many other plants out there in the landscape. I love this one. It's durable. It's heat tolerant. This is going to work zones five through nine. So anywhere you can really grow Japanese maples. A lot of our listeners are Japanese maple fans. So we're throwing the toe in the conifers today. This one's going to work zones five through nine as well. So very comparable to your Japanese maples. Again, Tim brings it up a lot, but the cedars do give you kind of like what we were mentioning earlier, that kind of lodge feel too. So this one's one of those large trees. It's going to fill out. It almost feels, you know, like you're, you're in an alpine area. It feels like you're up high on a mountaintop somewhere. It kind of gives you that that aesthetic to it. Now, it kind of just makes you want to sit back and like have a campfire, like a lodge. Like it just feels like somewhere you should be making s'mores when you're hanging out with this plant. You know what I mean? And it's got that appearance to it, especially that blue in the garden really adds so much texturally because of the size and the color. Uh, It's easy to build around this one in your garden. So you can make this a focal point in your bed or, you know, one of the larger bones of the garden, but it's going to be easy to kind of fill out around it and complement that color. 
like many of the conifers, they need good drainage, but especially so for the Cedrus Atlanticas, I like to plant them on a mound out there in the landscape just to make sure you go ahead and give them that extra drainage to begin with. If you're overwatering, you may get some early needle drop on some of the Cedrus Atlantica selections. Uh, coming at number 17, we've got Cryptomeria japonica, Golden Promise. And our good friend Tom Cox loved Cryptomerias. They grew very well for him down in Georgia. One of the reasons I like the Cryptomeria japonicas is they can do so well in a more shaded situation. They're a conifer that can handle a little bit more shade and higher heat, which you can't get out of many conifers. Cryptomerias do that in such a great way, being a Japanese cedar. Golden Promise is a dwarf compact selection of a golden Japanese cedar reaching four foot by four foot in 10 years. It fits in a lot of smaller spaces. Give it some sunlight to really peak up that golden color on Cryptomeria japonica Golden Promise. Now this one's uh, typically like a four by four ball. So you do get a little bit more of that globe shape. As the name implies, great yellows. And this one's going to work zones five through nine as well. So it's going to work anywhere you can be growing Japanese maples. Now, this one's also very popular because of that ball shape for container gardening, uh, you know, smaller area gardening where you want something that's going to add high texture, high color, but not take up all your space. This one's perfect for that small conifer garden. And it's going to it's going to plant predominantly well with Japanese maples, too. I mean, especially if you're growing, you know, maroon or dark red lace leaves, that yellow is going to really brighten up a spot in the garden. Coming at number 16, we have our first deciduous conifer. This is a conifer that drops all of its needles during the winter. We've got Metasequoia glyptostroboides, Sherman's Nordlich, Northlight, Dawn Redwood. What's wrong with my Dawn Redwood? You sent me one that's completely out of leaf. So we get that sometimes. I love Sherman's Nordlich. You'll see this one sometimes sold as Northern Light, uh, same plant, or Sherman's Northern Light, or some version of that. Um, absolutely adorable plant. This I, I can't believe it's not further up on the list. Yeah, that's for sure. It can get about six foot by four foot in 10 years. It has a real bright, creamy white color to the foliage. It was found as a witch's broom on the cultivar white spot uh, by Sherman. And that's why it says Sherman's Nordlich in there, which is German for North Light. That's what Nordlich tra translates as. And this is just a ornamental tree that you can use in those wetter spots in the garden where you can't use many of the other conifers and you can't use many of your maples. You can put a Sherman's Nordlich to really add that ornamental peel in that wetter spot. This is probably the most popular Dawn Redwood. It's a great plant, compact, dense. You know, Hink Van Kampen kind of got this one in the trade. He got it from Sherman, who found it on white spot there and really got it grafted. Absolutely awesome plant. I mean, I know they've been using this one predominantly at the Buckholtz farm for many years. He was one of the very first to be growing this in the United States. In fact, his, his plant that's donated to the Ralston kind of got our, us started on this one. It's kind of the quintessential uh, dwarf. I mean, you get everything that's going on with white spot, but in that dwarf habit, you get some blues, you get some almost yellowish green shades. You get a lot going on in there, and it looks great in a container. It looks great in the ground. I absolutely love this one to pair with Japanese maples, obviously, as why it's so popular here on Mr. Maple. We listed a six foot by four foot in 10 years, but an absolutely outstanding plant. Now, I mentioned earlier that this did so well in those wet spots in the garden. Don't worry, this also does well in the drier spots in the garden. It performs exceptionally in almost anywhere, and it is a really cool tree. One of the things that are, I love about Dawn Redwoods is you get that amazing appeal through the foliage, but when the foliage drops on mature specimens, you get that redwood appearance on the bark itself, and that gives an additional winter interest on the bark of redwood trees. And being a Dawn Redwood, this one is exceptional. Even as it, as it matures, you get a really nice tree that gives you some good winter interest out there as well. All right, coming in here at number 15 on the Customer Choice Awards, we got one of my favorite conifers, Pinostrobus sea urchin. This is a dwarf white pine. Another one introduced by Sid Waxman. Uh, this was a seedling from a witch's broom. Sid Waxman actually found, and he talked to Dr. Olson about this one time, or at least passed this information on, that about 50% of the, the seedlings from witch's brooms would also train that dwarf trait. Now, I don't know if the original one there is in New York or if that's one of the uh, first ones grafted, but an outstanding plant from Sid Waxman. Uh, we typically list this one as two feet by about three feet wide, so it makes a little bit more of a width than it does height at first. Absolutely outstanding dwarf white pine. On one of the Maple Society meeting post tours, we post toured to the New York Botanical Garden. And they are actually had a tram that went around, and they explained you know some of the plants as they went around, and they actually mentioned that sea urchin was found by Sid Waxman and went into detail about witches' brooms. This is my kind of ride, like this automated voice, and it's like 
in 77, Sid Wax, I don't know what year, but it like had the whole little story. And it was like, man, forget it's a small world after all. Give me the the Conifer tour here with the explanation. Love it. I, I was like, that is insane. I mean, I've never heard... You know, you go to a zoo, they say, tigers like to eat, you know, this, 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 and this. <laughs> and they just give you some boring stats. And they're actually giving interesting information about sea urchin. And I was like, oh, man, that's killer. Again, there's something to be said about a name. Sea urchin's got a great name. It looks like a sea urchin. It's got that kind of spiky quality to it. Even though it's not a spiky plant, it's got that that quality to it. I've got one in my garden that is probably every bit of three feet wide now by two feet tall on a standard. So I've got it on about a two-foot standard. I'm uh, thinking about moving it to a big conifer bed I'm working on, but absolutely outstanding plant. That's one that's going to work zones three through eight. And you, if you look at a picture of sea urchin, you'll see why it's popular. I mean, it's 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 always going to be one that's highly sought after. Another one I can add to that octopus's garden with the peve starfish when I'm when I'm creating my under undersea world. With your green penguin? With my green penguin, yeah, he'll be he'll be on the bank over there. <laughs> but uh, sea urchin is one of those fun plants. A lot of these dwarf pinostrobus, people sometimes will say, oh, those things are more difficult for me. Well, I'll give you the extra tip. Good drainage is key. Even more drainage than your typical pinostrobus, being it's so dense and compact, you need to raise it up in a bed. You need to have it on a mound. It will do really well for you. It's been a hardier tree for us here in Western North Carolina, and it has been a fantastic and easy grower for us when we gave it good drainage. All right, y'all, coming in here at number 14, we got another deciduous conifer. We've got Metasequoia glyptros from Boides Amber Glow trademark. Now, this is a fun plant. Uh, it's another Dawn Redwood, obviously. This one is exceptional for the colors, as the name implies, amber. It has some great amber hues. And anytime you can incorporate that into the, the landscape, it just really shows out. Now, Amber Glow can give you some bright yellow color out there in the landscape, but if you give it some sunlight, you start to get some of that amber uh, tone, some bronzing across that. Especially in the early spring. In the early spring, and even some a little bit during the summer on top of the golden foliage. The fall is where this one has some of the most outstanding fall color, giving you some amazing bronze, amber, uh, orange kind of colors in the fall off of the needles. So before this tree actually drops its needles, you actually get an amazing fall color on top of you know the winter interest that Don Rhodes can provide and the spring interest with the foliage. Now, you're going to need some space for this one. We do list this one as 25 foot by 10 foot wide, even in that 10-year period. So this is a Dawn Redwood that gets out there. It grows. It's vigorous. Makes more of a landscape tree. So this one's going to be a tree you're standing under. Uh, so one of our larger conifers here on the list. Now, this one's also going to work zones four through eight. And uh, again, the Dawn Redwoods can handle a little damper spot. They don't require that, but they can handle a little bit damper spot in the landscape. Coming at number 13, we've got Camacypris obtusa, Cheerman, a dwarf Hinoki cypress. A ah, great plant. Uh, this one is always popular for us. You know, I've seen it even higher up on our list. There's been years where that's definitely number one on our list for our top sales for conifers. This one's going to work zones four through eight, and it comes in at one of those miniature conifer sizes at around two and a half foot by about two foot wide in 10 years. This is an excellent dwarf conifer. It's very easy to grow. It's very popular for container gardening. And it's easy to see why people like this one. It makes these little cathedrals. It kind of makes these little you know, individual towers, if you will, as it grows. And it's just super cute in the garden. I mean, it, it fits into small areas, fits into rock gardens, fits into miniature gardens, railroad gardens, fairy gardens, anywhere you're looking for something small and a high interest. It, it really brings your, your, your uh, interest per foot on this one is, is going to do well. It really has a good blue silver kind of color. The sprays of foliage really has this interesting way of giving a unique texture out there in the landscape. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, the railroad gardens. The North Carolina Arboretum has a railroad garden, and they actually use Camacypris obtusa chairman in it. And it it gives this interesting texture and this interesting tree that's in this railroad garden with some good silver blue type color in a real small stature. And so it's an excellent tree for those smaller gardens, but it doesn't have to be a small garden. I mean, we've got one at the entranceway to Hillstone Arboretum that's, you know, a really old specimen. It's probably close to six feet. Uh, it's one of the uh, one of the earlier specimens from when this tree was brought into the country. That one came over from Highland Creek Nursery to our nursery in 2013, and it was a big plant then. Yeah, and so it, it is a gorgeous tree that you, you can enjoy in the landscape, and it just does this in a unique way with some nice vertical interest. All right, y'all, coming in here at number 12, we've got Pinus sylvestris mulsari, dwarf yellow Scots pine. 
awesome plant. This one was introduced uh, back in the 1900s, so early 1900s in France by Mulser Nursery. It is a great plant. I mean, it's been around for a while, and it's still popular for good reason. I always want to rename this one Yellow Penguin. You probably heard me say it a million times. I want the Yellow Penguin to go with the Green Penguin. I, I'm shocked to see it beating Green Penguin so much. We must have offered it a ton more this year. Normally, it comes in second to Green Penguin, but uh, I get it. People are starting to find out about it, even with the name Mulserai not being quite as marketable as Yellow Penguin. I think it's catching on. Well, you know, recently I saw on Facebook... Uh, Philippe actually released one called Philippe's Yellow Penguin. And I was like, that's a great name. That's a phenomenal name. His line, he was thinking the same things we were. And Pinus Sylvestris Mosera, it's got that short needles and the long needles, just like Green Penguin does. It has a very similar shape, reaching five foot by three foot in 10 years. It it stays dense and compact. But the interesting thing about Mosera is it's green during the spring and the summer, and then as the winter approaches and you get those intense colds starting to come on, this tree changes color to a yellow. And so it is one of those pines that changes and gives you essentially a winter interest that's not just your typical evergreen, but a change of the seasons with that bright yellow color out there in the landscape. Now we list this one as five by three in 10 years, so slightly more vigorous than the green penguin, although I love pairing these two together. I, I like putting them side by side. That winter garden's phenomenal. And if you've already got the little green Christmas tree there, why not have a yellow one right there to match it? You can decorate it. It's a gorgeous little plant. It's going to work zones 3 through 8B. And incredibly durable, incredibly colorful. Looks great in the container. Looks great in the garden. And again, it gives you that spark of color. It's going to light up and be a golden yellow as things are getting more and more drab in the garden in the winter months. It's kind of something to look forward to, that changing beauty. And I love when conifers go through changes. It's just a little something extra on the evergreen. Coming in at number 11, we've got one of my favorite architecturally interesting plants. We've got Pinus nigra, Oregon green. Now, this is a plant that almost looks like cactuses the way it can grow out there in the landscape. I mean, it has this rich evergreen color. It can easily be trained and shaped. It's an Austrian black pine tree, but it has a unique texture and a unique way it grows out there in the landscape that just looks like a bonsai. It looks like it's already been trained and shaped. And you can train and shape these to make them even more interesting out there in the landscape. I didn't know this one came from Australia. <laughs> Austrian? Yeah, I, did, I had no idea. I mean, throw another shrimp on the barbie. It's a great plant. <laughs> this one's going to work zones four through eight, which, you know, that's pretty good from Australia. And this one's going to be about <laughs> 10 foot tall by about six foot wide in a 10 year period. Uh, you know, Austrian black pines, you don't think of them coming from Australia, but just great plants. <laughs> Uh, Oregon green is just one of those plants that should be used more in the landscape because they grab people's attention. I mean, we, were, my wife and I were driving through a local subdivision and I was like, there's an Oregon green. She was like, why are you getting so excited about that? I'm like, because more people need to use them <laughs> because they have such a cool shape out there. I mean, it's, it's unlike any of the other pine trees and Oregon green just does that in a unique way. Every time I see Austrian black pines, I think throw another shrimp on the barbie. You know what I mean? All right, coming in here at number 10. You, you say it. This one's hard to say. Pinus Engelmania Bush's Lace. Yep, that was it. It is a <laughs> rare Engelman spruce. Awesome plant to be growing. Now, Bush's Lace is one of those plants that has a nice sort of gently weeping habit. It has a silver blue foliage to the needles itself. Being an Engelman spruce, it can go zones three through eight. Uh, it has this gentle, graceful weeping habit to it. I'm actually surprised this is so high up on the list. Yeah, I'm a little shocked, too, this one's this high up on the list. And it sold out this year, so it could have been even higher. Right. I mean, it, this tree is one that we offered for the very first time this year on Mr. Maple, and that may be one of the reasons why it's so high is because not many of our customers had it in their landscape. But when we offered it, it's sold out. We relisted it, sold out. And so, oddly enough, it could be even higher than this uh, on here. But it is a rare Picea Engelmania. And it's one that you don't see too often in the nursery trade. Yeah, it's actually a hybrid with Picea pungens, making it pretty rare there. Now, the terminals will remain upright. So as you continue to grow this plant, it will put on term upright terminals, but then a lot of it will weep down. So it's kind of an interesting shape overall. Bush's Lace has been super popular for us, typically reaching around 12 foot tall, by about five foot wide in 10 years. Now, I also like to give you the zones on these because everybody always asks, you didn't put the zones in. So this one is going to work zones three through eight for you conifer heads. Uh, coming in at number nine, we've got Camacyparis pacifera, baby blue ice. And this is one of my favorite conifers on this list. 
it gives you a really good baby blue color because the foliage is blue with hints of silver in there and it makes it look even brighter because of that. It has this really nice conical habit to it. It isn't a very fast growing tree, but it is a beautiful tree and an easy tree to grow that can add that flash of blue color, being one of the bluest trees that we have on this list today. Absolutely love this plant. Now, if you want to see a great specimen, let's go to our Mr. Maple Show YouTube channel. Go watch our our walkthrough of Buckholtz Garden. There is one of my favorite specimens that's ever there at Buckholtz Nursery. Uh, really a great plant. Baby blue ice. It brings everything you want in the blue shades. It's one of my favorite blues overall. The blue color is a more picked up bright blue than most conifers. So you really get that baby blue, tar hill blue, sky blue kind of hue going on here. It's going to work zones three, or excuse me, zones four through eight, uh, just so an exceptional durability there as well. It's going to, you know, kind of expand zones there for most people. Really a great one, whether you're doing it in the container or in the ground. And that color is really what, what draws the eye. And the color is so great on this one. Um, I, I was actually surprised to see it all the way down here at number nine. I could have seen this being much higher up on our list. And I looked down at my sizes I wrote down from our size references, and I thought it said 3 by 25. And I was like, gum!" but it's 3 by 2.5. So 3 by 2.5 foot, typically in that 10-year span, and making it a little bit more of a teardrop shape overall, too. It tends to grow in a small teardrop. Coming in at number eight, we've got Pasea orientalis skylands. And this is a golden oriental spruce. It has this really nice upright shape. It is fairly narrow overall, fairly pyramidal, but narrow in its habit, reaching uh, 15 feet in height by five foot in width in 10 years. And it gives an amazing bright yellow color out in the landscape. Now, people often say, hey, my skylands is burning whenever they sh try to get established. And it may burn a little bit while it's getting established, but once it's established, typically you don't see much burn on this conifer after that. And the, the sunlight hitting the needles is what intensifies the yellow color on Picea orientalis skylands. So make sure you give this tree plenty of sunlight out there in the landscape. You know, I was shocked to see this as low as eight, too. If I were a betting man and you told me to guess our list, I would have thought this and maybe Blue Ice would have been in the top three. Uh, we sell a lot of skylands. It's beautiful. Uh, now, one of the first times I ever saw skylands was at Nancy Vermeulen's place. Ed Shin took us over to visit Nancy Vermeulen. This is probably like 2010, maybe even earlier, maybe 2009, when we went and visited Ed Shin. Uh, absolutely beautiful plant. I thought it was columnar. I thought she, but it actually, she'd actually taken so much sinewood off the tree because it was so popular for her that her tree was columnar from sinewood collection. She had a cherry picker out there and she'd cut so many signs off of it. And I later learned, you know, the, the form of the tree is much denser and fuller than that. Absolutely love this plant though. It is, it's one that brings it, it's going to work zones four through eight. And we typically list this one as 15 feet by about five to six feet wide in that 10 year span, but absolutely a phenomenal plant. Now, the more the sun is getting on the growth there, the new growth will be more intensely yellow. So you want to give it some sunlight to pick those colors up. Your hotter zones, you'll need to give it a little bit more late day shade, but absolutely exceptional oriental spruce. At that time, Matt and I too, when we visited Nancy, we were only maple growers. I mean, we maples were our thing, and she gave us five conifers in one gallon, and one of them was a Picea orientalis skylands that we still have in the gardens at Hillstone Arboretum today at our uncle's home. This Nancy introduced us into conifers and said, hey, you need to grow these in companionship with your Japanese maples. I mean, her family introduced burgundy lace. They introduced... Uh, Riley's Red, also known as Red Feathers, into the nursery trade. So they introduced Burgundy Lime, some great Japanese maples. And she said, these are great companion plants with Japanese maples. And I think Nancy would uh, be very proud of us today offering we listened, all these. finally. Yeah, we, we <laughs> listened, and now we've offered so many conifers here on Mr. Maple. All right, y'all, come in here at number seven. We got Pasea pungens globosa. Now, this is one of the most intense dwarf blue spruce. This is a Colorado blue spruce that really shows out for those blue tones. It's going to work zones three through seven. But what really makes this one so popular is those light blue shades. And it gives you those light blue shades that's like a silver blue. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of the most popular landscape trees that's on this list. I mean, if you're talking about common landscape use, this is one of the ones now that people are using everywhere because it gives you that round ball shape effect reaching four foot by four foot in 10 years. But it does that with that blue color that can be used, often used in front of business signage and often used in commercial landscaping. 
And it's also used now in the home landscaping where people can use that blue color to contrast so well with anything else in their garden. Yeah, there's definitely something to be said about a, a tree that's one durable but doesn't take over the landscape. And this is one that's going to fit a lot of spaces. It's going to bring high intensity colors, but it's not going to be a tree that you, uh, you, know, you have to remove from your office space or something like that. It does fill out a nice area and doesn't block your windows. It doesn't outgrow the space. And the colors are just awesome. I mean, that, that's really the bottom line on that one is the color change. So coming in at number six, we've got Thuya occidentalis, Anique, Sienna Sunset, the Chia Pet of Golden Arborvitae. <laughs> I often call this one the Chia Pet. I stick sunglasses in them sometimes. This is one of those ones that employees grab up because they see them in person, and we sell it every time at open house because people come and see it, and it looks like a Chia Pet. It's got that Chia Pet quality. It looks like a little round ball, uh, it, whether it's in the fall or the winter or the spring. The colors are changing. It kind of goes through some sunset you know, like changes to it. You can get some oranges in it more during the winter. You can get some real nice crisp greens in it in the spring to almost light yellows. So you really just get these, you know, changing beauty of colors on this uh, dwarf golden arbor variety. And it looks great in a container. It looks great in a pot. Like it looks like the perfect pot topper. In fact, I really enjoy when people put this one in a small patio planter and just let it be a little, you know, almost afro top looking on top of the container it looks like i want to put sunglasses on it It looks so cool it's just a fun little plant it looks like something that might talk to you it looks just like a perfect little ball in the garden the texture of this is unreal and you want to go up and just touch it it feels like it's a live creature out there and it's one of those plants that you just want to run your hands through the plant because of how soft the foliage is the colors are so attractive being those orange bronzes that you get during the winter to the lime green yellows you get during the spring. Seeing a sunset gives you a unique color, unique texture, and it's just a cute conifer to use out there in the landscape and garden that'll make your home and garden look outstanding in a very special way. This one's going to work zones four through eight. We listed as three by three, which I think is a little generous. It feels even smaller than that in 10 years. It's almost like a a much dwarfer form of fire chief. I mean, the colors are different, but it has some of the things people like about that one in a much smaller, denser form. Coming in at number five, this is the, the Consumer's Choice Awards. We're already down to number five. We've got AB's Koreana Kohoots Icebreaker, which is a dwarf Korean fur. We could see this one even being higher. Uh, Kohoots Icebreaker, uh, always super popular. Uh, now, we've listed these in Welsh pots and in one gallons. I don't know if the one gallons got added to it. It might even clump the, the list a little bit if they did. This one works four through seven. Uh, we've been bringing plenty of these in from our Buckholtz Nursery uh, to offer here at Mr. Maple. Now, we list this one as two by two in 10 years. It's an exceptional plant. Whenever possible, we do like to get this one on Firma. Uh, you'll notice whenever we have plants on Firma, though, they do say so on our website. So it'll be listed almost as a separate thing. Like, we'll list them a separate listing completely. That way, you know what you're getting. Now, oddly enough, I haven't seen Hortzman Silberlock on this list, but Kohut's Icebreaker is a witch's broom that happened on the cult of our Hortzman Silberlock. Hortzman Silberlock is popular for having the silver backside to the foliage that gives this unique texture out there. And the way Kohut's Icebreaker is even more recurved on the needles shows off the silver backside to the needle so much better on this small little compact selection. It's going to reach two feet by two feet in 10 years. And remember, the more dense and compact these conifers are, the better you need to make sure you have good drainage for these conifers. Overwatering can cause a lot of issues, especially on these dense, compact conifers. And Kohut's Icebreaker, sometimes just referred to as Icebreaker, is a gorgeous one to add that silver color in the garden. Hey, if you're wanting to hit on a gardener, it'd be a great way to break the ice. <laughs> this one's going to work zones four through seven. It can be a little trickier in more, some of those more humid areas. So watch out in some of those more humid areas. You know, heat index and humidity can certainly be factors for some of these conifers. It's a great plant, though, and I, I just love everything it brings to the table. It's a showstopper, and it's one that, that kind of gets a visceral reaction from people when they see it. It's one of those ones that people remember it. They, they think about it a lot, and uh, the colors really just show out. I mean, it, it definitely... The name also works. I mean, the name itself kind of pulls you back to what you're thinking about. Like, it looks ice-like with all that white in there. So, I, th I think that's a big factor, too, for why it's so popular. Now, being an Abies Coriana, often people graft these two other Abies Coriana 
uh, you can graft them to things like Abies Firma to make them more heat tolerant and be able to push down to zone eight. Uh, we will be offering in the future many different AB selections that are grafted onto AB's Firma, but they will be specifically labeled as grafted onto AB's Firma. Uh, that's something that doesn't matter to many of our people up north or in the Pacific Northwest, but it, it definitely helps a lot when you're, when you're gardening with conifers in the deep south. Coming at number four, we've got Metascoia, Glyptostraboides, Miss Grace, a Weeping Dawn Redwood, Vitalum Buckholtz, coming in here at number four. Shocked me to see this one all the way up at four. I love this plant. We've offered it a ton. Um, you know, I, I would expect to see the numbers higher on this one for 2024 because we bought Buckholtz Nursery at the end of 2023. I was shocked to see it so popular in 2023 because uh, we didn't have huge numbers of it from Buckholtz Farm, but it, it put up big numbers here. This one's going to work zones four through eight. We typically list this one as three by five, so it is going to get a little wider than it does tall. Think of it almost as a lace leaf maple. It kind of grows that cascading umbrella shape. You can certainly stake up a central leader, but this is one that's going to be, you know, Miss Grace, the name's part, it's got that graceful weeping habit to it. And it has this really nice horizontal strongly horizontal uh, weeping habit, and then it just hooks down towards the end of the branches. So when you get to the terminals of the weeping branches, you get this really nice hooking habit to it that gives this tree something a little bit different out there in the landscape. When this tree has needles on it, it's exceptional. When it drops its needles, the form and the bark take over and steal the show in the garden. This Miss Grace is a plant, doesn't get very large out there, but again, can handle those wetter places in the garden and also handle those drier places in the garden. So you can use this in so many different places to add a unique interest. This is perfect for a natural pond area that might be too wet for a lace leaf like Crimson Queen, and you wanted something small there and, and kind of having that same graceful appeal to it. And you wouldn't want to put it next to a pond liner, but this is perfect for an area where you have a natural pond. You want to add that, that elegant lace leaf quality to it, that kind of weeping form, but you don't want something that's going to take over. Well, this can handle that slightly soggier spot that a Japanese maple might have stayed too wet at. I've seen a lot of people using this around more natural style ponds. Absolutely beautiful plant to be growing. I uh, love it. And again, kind of shocked to see it all the way up at four. I'm shocked to beat Sherman's Nordlick, but uh, incredible Dawn Redwood. Coming at number three, we've got one of my favorite types of conifers, Pinus thumbergia. It's a Japanese black pine. This cultivar specifically that's listed here is Kotobuki. No shocker to see this high up on the list. I've said it before, but if I had to pick a favorite species of conifer, it's probably Pinus thumbergii. Japanese black pines, they're just cool plants. I love them. I love how durable they are. This works zones 5 through 10. So zones 5 through 10, that's a lot of the United States. You put that on a map, zones 5 through 10, I mean, it just goes everywhere. So that's a part of the appeal is that we could ship this one to more places. Uh, Japanese black pines are so great for bonsai. They're great for the landscape. And... Uh, Kotobuki is no exception. It, it is a gorgeous overall plant. It has a real regal look to it. Now, Kotobuki is a term that's used to describe a Japanese drama. And this one does add a lot of dramatic effect out there in the landscape. It's also one of the trees that on this whole list of all of our trees, it had the shortest time on the website to make that. this list. And it came in at number three while doing that. It so did some work quick. It did a lot of work very quickly to get to number three in a short time frame on our website. So I'm sure if we had more, it could be all the way up to number one. It has shorter needles for a Japanese black pine. And the Japanese black pines, to me, I love them because they're salt tolerant, heat tolerant. They provide uh, one of these trees that gives a unique ornamental pill in the landscape with a very stoic presence. And this one has basically this really nice cathedral-like presence in a small space, but at the same time, it is a little more shade tolerant than many of your other pines, so it's, it makes a great companion plant with many Japanese maples out there in the garden. Now, this one's going to be uh, five foot tall by three foot wide in a 10-year span, and uh, hey, we get a lot of Texas gardeners wanting to do more conifers. We hear you guys. You know, Japanese black pines are a priority for us. Some of our up in production on a lot of our Japanese black pines. We're going to be bringing back things like Bansho Show, uh, some of the uh, on die, the cork bark, some of the really fun ones. So expect to see more Japanese black pines hitting the market here on MrMaple.com and for some great affordable price. Coming in here at number two, we've got Camacyprus nucatensis green arrow, a narrow weeping Alaskan. Uh, this is a great plant. Another introduction uh, that we we love. It just has that cathedral-like shape in the landscape. This one's going to be uh, zones four through eight. 
and I absolutely love what it does. It's tall, it brings vertical interest. Uh, we offer this one as frequently as we can. Uh, we've also done a variation of this one, you know, named at the Buckholtz Farm called Sparkling Arrow, which is a variegated form of this. So I'll mention that when we bring this one up, it's always going to be be asked if that's a sparkling, if Sparkling Arrow is a form of this, and it is. So you're going to get a very similar shape to this, but with more variegation. Now, Green Arrow is no slouch in itself. This one's going to be a 20-footer that's only about three to four feet wide. So you get a nice vertical interest in the, in the landscape. You bring the eyes up in the garden. The garden feels bigger because of all that height. Now, older specimens will start to develop a skirt at the base. I do often recommend to prune this out to promote more of that more narrow shape and more height. Uh, but Green Arrow, it gives you this extremely narrow vertical interest out there in the landscape that's going to grab your attention. Working in zones four through eight and getting real tall and narrow, it really adds a special piece out there in the garden. When you use that vertical out there in the landscape, it draws your eye to look and see the full landscape, not just what's in front of you. And it makes the garden appear bigger. It makes the garden appear like this monumental thing that you've got out there in the landscape. And being tall and narrow, Green Arrow does that in a very nice way. All right, guys, we're almost up to our number one spot. But first, before we do, make sure to go give us five stars on your favorite podcast platform. We appreciate five-star Google reviews. And if you want to join those live chats, those are on the YouTube channel, The Mr. Maple Show, on Sunday evenings. They're a great way to get involved in our Mr. Maple community. But definitely go find us on something. Give us a good review there. We love putting out daily gardening content. And this talk show on plants, it happens every single week. So we're putting out podcasts every single week here on The Mr. Maple Show. And while you're sitting and contemplating what could possibly be at number one, I've got some things that I'm surprised did not make the list. Uh, one of them is Picea Gold Drift. Oh, yeah. Uh, we've offered this in decent numbers this year. We sold quite a bit of them, but I'm really surprised Gold Drift did not make this list, being an excellent selection from Bob Vincham. Well, I'll tell people uh, also, uh, 2023 was our biggest year ever for conifers. We sold a lot of conifers. It was our biggest year ever at our nursery, but it was a big year for conifers. We sold a ton of conifers. I do think there'll probably be more switch up from year to year from our conifer list and our maple list because we, we do curate our collections. So you might not see the same conifer every single year where there are some top 40 maples that we do no matter what. So you'll see some of these probably change out from year to year on our listing. Some are going to be tried and true and back every single season. But it is an interesting list for sure. I'm also surprised we haven't seen Cedars Atlantica Glauca Pendula on this list. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is one of the most con – typically, it's in the top five conifers that we list whenever we list mm -hmm. them. It didn't put up enough numbers this year, but I could easily see Thunderhead – being in our top three, too. There's been a lot of years where Pinus Thumbergia Thunderhead would probably be number one just on sheer volume. I totally agree. And it's shocking to me that those th uh, three plants did not make this list because they're extremely popular every time we list them. I'm guessing some of these others just happen to put up more numbers. I, I and, think people will be shocked by number one. This is a good plant, though. Coming at number one, we've got Cama Cypress, Lawsoniana, Whistles, Soguaro. Yeah, this is a Lawson Cypress. And I know the reason this one hit number one this year. This year, we offered this on disease-resistant rootstock, which is the only way to be growing this one. So you got to graft it to disease-resistant rootstock. I've grown this before from rooted cuttings. I had such high hopes for it, and it was a complete dog. I don't even think I offered many of them from rooted cuttings. When you graft it onto that disease-resistant rootstock, it is so superior. This one's going to work zones four through eight. Exceptional plant. Love the shapes it made. And I know our customers were excited to be getting this one you know, the superior plant on the disease-resistant rootstock. Now, it's called Whistle Saguaro because it looks like a saguaro cactus as this tree matures out there in the landscape. It's got an evergreen color that is just this rich kind of color that is unique and stands out from many other plants. But the unique texture and the habit of this tree is what makes this tree so appealing in the landscape. It'll reach six feet in height by three foot in width in 10 years. But these cathedrals that it puts on gives it that cactus-like a presence, and it just grabs your attention out there in the garden. To me, this is a, an, a, a winner, winner all around, and it's because it's grafted onto that disease-resistant rootstock, and that's really what makes the Camus Cypress Lawsoniana Whistle Saguaro so special. So this was actually found in Holland as a witch's broom off the cultivar uh, whistly eye, uh, which gives it you know more of that smaller, compact, denser habit to it. We typically list this one as six feet tall by about three feet wide. I do love that it kind of just makes these crazy shapes. It kind of has this tall columnar look to it, but you kind of get these crazy arms reaching off of it. It's got a lot of character. 
it's a great plant. I do recommend if you ever go after this one, make sure you're buying it with the disease resistant rootstock. It makes all the difference in the world. Phenomenal plant. Shocked to see Whistle Cigar showing up at number one. I didn't expect that. I would have bet on Baby Blue Eyes. Now, it also was on the website for a short period of time this year. It may have been even higher right? Had, had the <laughs> on, whole the, season. on the shots fired if I had the whole season like some of these others on this list. Well, guys, let us know if you'd like to see more conifer-related podcasts. This is one of our first dives into a conifer podcast here on the Mr. Maple Show. We do a ton of great conifers at Mr. Maple. We bring 10 new plants every single Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. It's actually 20. You'll see a great deal of those being conifers. So people are quite shocked to find that we sell several thousand types of conifers here at our nursery and a huge mix of those. Uh, with the Buckholz Nursery expansion, we're only going to be doing more and more conifers and more interesting ones. They actually have some of their own conifer selections, so we'll be focusing on a lot of those. And uh, just a great time to be growing conifers here at Mr. Maple. And if you're a wholesale garden center looking, and you've got a you're a boutique garden center, and you're interested in conifers, check out our Buckholz Farm. We've got one of the best wholesale places, Buckholz Farm for those u- unique boutique garden centers all across the country. And they love conifers. They've got amazing conifer selection. And you can go sign up to be a customer if you're a wholesale customer. And don't worry if you're retail. We're just going to keep bringing those crazy tenant tens on Mr. Maple. Uh, guys, we love you being part of this. Thanks for signing up for our weekly talk show here about plants. Today we focused on conifers. And uh, we hope that's something you'll want to see more of. Let us know in our Facebook group or in the comment section below our YouTube video if you'd like to see more conifer-related podcasts. We may do some interviews with some really fun conifer experts coming up. we got a lot of friends that we love to talk to. We did a great one with Tom Cox, the late, great Tom Cox. That was one we had to get in early. I know I'd love to talk to Gary G. There's so many people I'd love to just sit down with and have some good conversations with. So let us know in the comment section if you'd like to see some more conifer-related podcasts. And uh, thanks for listening. Take care. God bless. And have a great day.